Good morning and welcome to the Free North. Good morning and a warm, warm welcome to the Free North Church in Inverness. I'm sorry that our services through the month of January and through the month of February will have to be online only. We take this decision following public health advice and the discussion of the elders in our own congregation to protect one another and to protect other vulnerable people, especially in light of the increased uh, prevalence of COVID-19 in the Highlands and particularly this new, more easily transmitted strain. We pray that God will deliver us from these difficulties. As uh, the picture begins to develop, we will let you know when we feel it is safe to meet again together for in-person worship. But for now, through January and February, we will only be able to meet online. We thank God for this provision. We're looking forward to having a camera system installed in the church so that we can more easily do live transmission of our services going forward. And these uh, cameras should be installed by the end of January. And if you are interested in being trained up to operate them and be part of the audiovisual team, we'd love to hear from you. And we particularly welcome having uh, some of our younger folk involved in that. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 139. The psalmist asks, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We lift up our hearts in worship and in our various homes we can lift up our voices in praise to God. lift up our hearts to God in prayer. Sovereign God, we worship you and we adore you. We thank you that we can meet together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. We pray, Lord, that you will draw close to us in our various homes, and that you will draw close to church communities up and down our land and around the world. We pray for the struggle against the COVID, and we ask that you would give grace and success to those who rule over us, to the health service, and to those who are administering vac vaccines and developing new treatments and therapies and new vaccines, both in this country and around the world. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will prevent a further loss of life, and that you will help those with difficulties and with difficult uh, illnesses of various kinds that are uh, causing extra anguish in times when we cannot freely visit one another or support each other. 
We ask for those whose mental health is poor, for those whose economic circumstances are difficult, for those who've had to uh, go out to the North Sea or to travel to get work and employment at this time. We pray for those who are anxious for loved ones, anxious for children unable to go to their schools. We pray for teachers and social workers, for the police, for the ambulance service, and for all who are engaged in any way in serving others in our society. Lord, bring us through these difficult days and bring the church through these difficult days. We want to pray for our young people and we thank you for them. We thank you for the vision that Fiona Cameron has to run an alpha course with young people. And we ask that people will want to be part of that, will enjoy it and be blessed in it. Bless our Sunday school. And we pray that you will help us in every way to love you and to serve you and to grow in grace. Now continue with us, we do pray, and smile upon us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to read God's Word together. And our reading today comes from the Old Testament and from the book of Jonah, the book of the prophet Jonah. I'm going to read the first chapter in Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to sail from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. And the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Amen. And may God bless that reading of his own word. I'm really delighted that Fiona Cameron is uh, wanting to run a course for young people where we can bring our questions and learn something of the Christian faith. The course is called Youth Alpha. It's beginning next weekend, 
and uh, Fiona will no doubt be in touch with young adults, with uh, teenagers in our congregation to encourage them to be part of that. It will be happening on Sunday mornings at about 10 o'clock and it will be online. Okay, you rolling? Okay, we're gonna scare Jason with this spider. Come on, we're gonna get him back. Watch it! Guys, this is a film set. You got it. Oh. Tons of things happen in our lives every day. And in a 24 hour period, we ask ourselves so many different questions. Like, what should I eat? What should I wear? Or who should I hang out with? Sometimes we ask bigger questions like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Who will I marry? Or where will I live? But every once in a while, we ask ourselves those even bigger questions. Questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose? And is there more to life than this? The reality is, there aren't a lot of places we can go to explore life's biggest questions. So on Alpha, we want to create a space where we can talk about those kind of questions in a way that's open and honest. In each one of our hearts, it's like we have a happiness bucket that we're constantly trying to fill. It can sound like this. If I just had uh, more money or nicer clothes or a new girlfriend, then I'd be happy. The nights would come and the girls would be gone. Like, they'd be just me, you know, me and I guess God, right? And I'm like, okay, there's definitely more to life than this. Like, I just want, I want, I want, I want, and you don't get anything. There's this deeper, even spiritual hunger that we're all trying to satisfy. As someone who grew up in an atheistic home, I wasn't just gonna accept what he was gonna say. So I was like, okay, did this actually happen historically? What's the evidence? I'm not gonna just buy into something because I get swept up in the emotion of it. You have approximately 570,000 hours left to live. And we wanna invite you to spend less than 24 of them with us on Alpha. This morning, after our service, if you are free for a few minutes to use the usual Zoom details, why don't you join up with a few others from our church family uh, for what we could call coffee time. After morning church, that's what we would normally do. We can do coffee time on Zoom, spending maybe 10, 15 minutes, just seeing who's around, chatting, catching up, and there will be a breakout room available for anyone who wants to use it if people want to go and spend a few minutes in prayer with some friends. It's good that we maintain friendship and fellowship when Scotland is back in a, a lockdown situation. Hello everyone. Did you know that if you read for 15 minutes of every day, you would read on average 12 books in a year? Now, there are a lot of other things that we might spend 15 minutes a day doing um, and not even think about it. Uh, but sometimes reading books can feel like so much more effort. Well, I wanted to let you know both about a book I've been reading and also encourage you to get reading more in 2021. Um, each month this year, we're going to have a, a book of the month. Uh, to help us engage with good Christian books on a whole range of topics. We'll look at personal discipleship, evangelism, missionary biographies, books for kids, and a whole host of books to get stuck into this year. Now, we know that reading scripture is the best way and the most important way we can get to know God, engage with him, um, and learn about how to live for him. And um, But reading good Christian books which help point us to God and apply his word to, to our lives is of great value. Um, and the first book um, that uh, we're going to look at is all about reading God's word. Now, maybe you start every year with good intentions for Bible reading, uh, but you struggle to keep going. Or maybe you just stick to the familiar passages because everything else feels a bit daunting. Um, or maybe you read regularly, but sometimes it's just a bit too familiar. Well, this is a great little book for you. Um, it's called Before You Read Your Bible um, by Matt Smithhurst. It's a short book which looks at how we should approach God's word with our hearts and our minds. 
It goes through nine different heart postures to help us look at how we can make the most of our time in God's word by approaching it in the right way. Um, It's less than 90 pages long, but it's full of helpful insights and challenges as we seek to get to know God better through his word. I've already got some copies of this, um, so if you'd like one, get in touch and I can pop it through your letterbox. All my contact details should be on the service guide. Um, And do keep an eye out for the other books we're going to be highlighting across the year. Um, Praying around the church, we come today to pray for the work in the Mark Inch and for the work in the island of Arran. And we're also going to offer uh, the Lord's Prayer. Father, we thank you that people around Scotland are praying today for, for us and praying especially for the work of our partners in the church plant in the Mark Inch, for Chris and for the team. We recognize how difficult this time has been when personal relationships are frustrated by the rules that we all have to live with. But we ask that you will keep opening up opportunities, both through the hot meals that are being provided and through the various ways in which friendships have already developed in the past. We ask that you will lead to a a strong team and then a strong congregation being built up in the Mark Inch, and that you'll keep giving wisdom and energy and spiritual protection to Chris and Catherine and to all the team. Thank you for raising up helpers for them, and we pray for Wesley and his family as they raise funds and prepare to come from the United States. We also pray for the congregation in the island of Arran in the Clyde, We recognize they've had a long vacancy and that they are dependent on uh, churches on the mainland such as Down Vale and their interim moderator to look after them. Lord, provide so that there can be regular ministry in Arran and in other rural parts of our nation where there is no uh, settled ministry. Be with Duncan Peters and the Glasgow and Argyle Presbytery in these days. Now, Lord, continue with us as we offer the prayer your Son taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'm very sorry that we can't have a proper thank you to John Macaulay as he steps down as our session clerk, or give a proper welcome to Brian Cameron as he takes on that big responsibility, having served us as the clerk to our deacon's court. If the church were able to meet in person, uh, we would be able to uh, greet these brothers and to commend them to God. But we can do that even as they are in their homes today. What I am able to do is to say to John and to Brian, thank you so much for your service to us. And we have a little gift for you both. Um, Just this month, Christian Focus have published a two-volume commentary on Luke's Gospel by the brilliant uh, author and teacher Dale Ralph Davis, Luke 1 to 13 and Luke 14 to 24. And uh, we're going to give copies of these books to you as a thank you from the congregation. We also welcome Stuart Vant into his new role as clerk to the Deacon's Court. Can I also uh, remind folk that we have lots of copies of the Explore Bible Notes available, and if you would like us to drop a copy through your letterbox, we can do that. Just request it. They, they are Bible Notes covering the months through to March, and uh, many people find them really helpful. We'll just pray for our brothers in their new roles. Lord, we want to thank you for all our 
uh, servants who serve the life of the church in different ways, uh, for men and women who use their gifts for your glory. And we thank you for the willingness of our session clerk, John Macaulay, to take on the role of presbytery clerk, a big role, a demanding role. And we pray you would bless him as he takes that up in the months to come. And we thank you for his years of service to us here in the local church. And we also thank you for Brian and for his willingness to take on that role of session clerk from John. And we ask that he would be guided by your spirit and given wisdom and patience every day. And bless these men in their lives before you, in their marriages and families. We also pray for Stuart as he takes on the role that Brian was doing. And we want to ask your blessing on him as his mum has been unwell and bless him in his marriage and in all the work that he does. And we pray that you'll keep us now and watch over us and help us to serve you faithfully for your glory. Amen. We're going to sing praises to God now with a version of Psalm 139. And this time this is from the New Scottish Hymns, Were I to Cross from Land to Land. Where I to cross from land to land and sail afar by sea, descend the depths or climb the heights, my Lord remains with me. We're going to begin today looking at the book of Jonah over the next few Sundays and seeking to learn what God is saying to us at the beginning of a new year from this most unusual Old Testament book. I wanted to do something a little bit different in January to give us something of a sense of direction and purpose. And I wasn't really anticipating that we would be back in a form of enforced lockdown during these opening months of the year. But I think this book of Jonah perhaps will help us to think clearly about who we are and how we are to relate to other people. 
how we are relate to our city and to the people who live here, the people we work alongside, and the people in our families. I guess everybody knows something about the story of Jonah. Most children would be able to draw a picture of what the story of Jonah is all about, and I would be amazed if the picture did not involve a man, a boat, and a big fish. There's a bit more to it than that child's eye view of this book. Indeed, this book, it seems to me, is very much about reading our hearts and our attitudes and asking if our heart sees our neighbor the way God's heart sees the world. If we have love and care and compassion for others and for lost men and women in the way that God does. The book begins like this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness, its trouble, has come up before me. We know a little bit more about the prophet Jonah from other parts of the Bible. He's mentioned in the second book of Kings, especially chapter 14, as a prophet who had a very popular message. He came to the northern tribes, to Israel, with a measure of reassurance, with a measure of uh, success to talk about. Their borders and the security of their kingdom were going to be established at least for a time. And so people would have lapped up the message of Jonah that God was on the side of Israel and that God was going to protect them from their enemies. We know that much about Jonah. We also know he was a real historical character because the New Testament talks about him and Jesus talks about him and the New Testament assumes he was a real prophet and that the events of his life really happened. But we come to this book that bears his name, and it's a bit strange, because it's not full of a prophet with a story for Israel, with a message for God's people. It's perhaps unique in the Old Testament as a book that's concerned about other peoples and other nations, and about a mission trip where Jonah is being sent by God to the north, to the northeast, to Assyria, into enemy territory, into the city of Nineveh, where bloodthirsty and brutal people live who threaten the very survival of Israel and Judah. Few empires have been as wicked and as cruel, as ruthless, as dangerous as the Assyrians. Yet there they were, and Jonah was being sent on mission from God to them. There are a number of things I want us to see in the passage this morning, and the first is the great God and his great word. The great God and his great word. A word about the style of this book. In terms of the structure of this book, it it says things twice. The first half of the book is God speaking to Jonah, giving him a task, and then Jonah interacting with pagan people, the pagan people behaving well, and then Jonah talking to God about it all. And you get that in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And you get that pattern repeated in chapter 3 and chapter 4. God sending his prophet to pagan people, the pagan people reacting to the words and the actions of God, and God speaking to Jonah about it all. That's the structure of the book. The other thing that I find interesting about the way this book is written is that it likes to talk about things that are big, 
things that are on the grand scale. There is a a nice Hebrew word for things that are huge, that are massive, the word gadol. And 14 times this book will use that word, and it will speak in other terms and language about things that are huge. So, you don't just get a storm in Jonah chapter 1. You get a huge storm. You get a huge city of Nineveh. You get huge fear among the sailors. You get a huge, a great fish. You get huge wickedness on the part of the people of Nineveh and Assyria. You get a huge sorrow and repentance from them and from their king. You get huge anger from the prophet Jonah. He's so angry he wants to die. God grows a vine, a plant to give shelter to Jonah. It's a huge vine. It grows in a day, but it's huge. And then along comes a worm to nibble at it, and along comes huge scorching heat to shrivel up the vine. And then you get huge love, huge pity, huge compassion from the heart of God. Everything in this book is on a grand scale. But nothing is bigger, nothing is more huge, more massive than the heart of God for this lost world. We have a great God who sends, who commissions one of his prophets from Israel with God's Word and with the name of God and with the hope of the covenant to pagans, to foreigners, to a pagan city, and to a pagan king. The amazing thing is that in chapter 1, the pagans who are on the ship with Jonah meet God. They have a life-changing encounter with God. And in chapter 3, the pagans in Nineveh meet God, and they, they realize how great God is and how great His Word is, and His Word has an impact on them. God is great, and His Word is great. But we're also learning that sometimes God's professing people, we are not what we should be. I am not what I should be, and perhaps you are not what you should be. If people were to stop us and ask us, do we believe in a great God and in His great Word, I'm sure we'd give all the right answers. But do we live as if our God is great? Do we deal with our fears and problems as if His Word is great? Or do we sometimes show that our hearts are small? God reveals Himself. The Word of the Lord came to Jonah, and His Word said, Go! There's a great city, a big city. Go! And to obey God would have meant traveling north and east to Nineveh. But Jonah goes west to the coast, and he looks for a ship that will take him further west, as far as the known world will allow him to travel to Tashish, which we think was probably somewhere like the Spanish or the Iberian Peninsula, Spain or Portugal, way over in Western Europe, the Western Mediterranean, as far away from Assyria, as far away from Nineveh as it was possible to travel. It's really sad. Jonah is, as one writer calls him, the prodigal prophet, the prophet who tried to run away from God as the prodigal son ran away from his father in the story in Luke's Gospel. But it's asking us about our attitudes and our heart and whether we might be a prodigal church today, whether we might be prodigal so-called Christians who are out of touch with God and out of touch with God's heart. We've got a great God with His great Word, and everything is big scale in this book, mass conversions, miraculous events. But do we have a big worldview? Do we have a worldview of a big God who can do big things in Scotland, in Inverness, in the Highlands? 
Do we believe that big things can happen in the church plant in the Mark Inch? Do we believe that big things can happen in our marriages, in our families, in our children's lives, among our neighbors, among our friends? Do we, will we see our city and our land the way God sees them? Don't believe for a moment that the book of Jonah is just a parable or a fable or a fiction. Don't get hung up on the fish and three days in the belly of the fish. Don't get hung up on the size of Nineveh or any of the other things that some writers and commentators seem to stumble over. The point of this book is that we serve a big God with all power, and his word is true. Do we believe? And will we get our understanding of life and the world from God and from his word, or from ourselves, from our own hearts, or from this world? That's the first thing. Big God and his great word. Great God, great word. The second thing that we have here is that we have a great city and its great wickedness we have the great city of Nineveh. And we know from this book and from the rest of Scripture how wicked the Ninevites were. They definitely needed to turn to the Lord and turn from their idols and turn from their cruelty and their mercilessness. If you were to visit the city of Nineveh in ancient times, you would be impressed by it, by its architecture and its size. But you would also be repulsed by the skulls of the victims of the slain around the city gates and the city walls. You would be appalled by the signs of bestial cruelty and lack of concern for the weak and for foreigners and for the needy. And yet God was concerned for that great city and grieved by its great wickedness. The miracles in the book of Jonah, the signs and wonders in the book of Jonah, they are there to make us ask questions about whether in our heart we are willing to see broken and needy and wicked people, messed up people, the way God sees them, and to deal with their wickedness face on, but also to call people to change and to repent. In the 17th century, the Bible commentator Matthew Henry came to the book of Jonah, and he said about this book that it is best understood by those who are most acquainted with their own hearts. When we read this book, we are reading ourselves. We are letting God read us. We are letting God take a peek inside of us at the kind of people that we are and the things that motivate us. What kind of church do you want to be when we come out of lockdown? What kind of Christian and what kind of lifestyle do you want to have? What kind of attitude do you want to have to this city and this time, to outsiders, even wicked ones? In Jonah chapter 4, at the beginning, we read that Jonah was angry because God had shown mercy to Nineveh. And he prayed in verse 2 of chapter 4, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. That's why I didn't go to the Ninevites. I didn't go to tell them about you because I knew you would show them mercy. And in my heart, I was angry with them. And in my heart, I hated them for their great wickedness. And I didn't want them to discover God's great mercy. Do you see what God does in the book of Jonah? Is He shows Jonah his heart and it's ugly, and it's proud, and it's nationalistic, and it's racist. He looks down on the pagans. He doesn't see them the way God sees them. He doesn't value them. He doesn't love them. He's not just running away from God. He's running away from pity and from compassion. Well, let this book challenge you and challenge me about what drives us 
and what motivates us. There will be many things in the Word of God I don't like hearing, but I must hear. There will be many things in the Word of God that will challenge you and that you won't like to hear, but we must hear them. Sometimes when I was in my teens, my my mum would tell me to, to watch my posture if I was slouched on a couch or slouched in a chair. Put your shoulders back. Straighten up your back. Stand tall. Don't be all hunched in your shoulders. Don't be all hunched in your posture or, or you'll end up bowed over and, and weak looking. Well, the Bible takes us and it looks at the posture of our hearts and it's saying to our hearts, if their heart change, if the posture of our heart is not worship, change. If the posture of our heart is not love, change. If the posture of our heart is all hunched over our own little things, change. Don't be so stooped. Don't be so depressed. Don't be so defeated. Stand up tall. God has great compassion, even for great cities and even for wicked people. We serve a great God with a great word, and we are called, as Jonah was, to a great city, even though it has great wickedness. The third and the last thing this morning is the great storm and its great fear. We're told in verse 4 that the Lord sent, literally, he hurled a great wind on the sea. He hurled a storm at the sea where Jonah was taking a sail away from his calling. By verse 12, we're going to be told that the sailors will hurl Jonah into the sea. God hurls the storm, and they are going to pick him up and throw him, hurl him into the waters. A little note about where Jonah was from. He was a man from Galilee. He was a man from the north, according to 2 Kings 14, from Gath Hafer. And that's about two miles from Nazareth. And it's interesting that Jonah is not the only prophet in the Bible who is pictured falling asleep in a boat that then goes through a huge storm. There is another prophet who also came from Galilee, the prophet from Nazareth, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was asleep in a storm on the Sea of Galilee, a terrifying storm, so that his disciples woke him in the boat and said to him, Master, don't you care that we're drowning? Don't you care that we're going to lose our lives? We're going to perish. And he showed that he was God, miraculously, by calming the wind and the waves with a word. And then they were more terrified of Jesus than they were of the storm. There is a similar account here in the book of Jonah of a supernatural storm and a prophet who's fast asleep in the belly of the boat. The crew are praying to their false gods, and they rebuke Jonah because he's sleeping when he could be praying. And they, they, they tried to rouse him and, and to show him what an urgent situation they were in. They were in a great storm, and it caused great fear. But when they learned who Jonah was, that he was a Hebrew, that he was a servant of the, the living God and a prophet, and that he was disobedient to God, then they began to fear God, who had sent the storm. And they began to seek God and to make vows to God. They, they come across as good men. They come across as teachable and open. They call on Jonah's God. They're very reluctant to toss a human being into the waves. And they, the day finishes for them making vows to God and sacrificing to God. And wittingly or unwittingly, Jonah's mission to pagans and foreigners has already begun because it looks like the crew of the ship have met the living God. It looks like the pagans are there rebuking the believer. Why aren't you praying? Back in the 19th century in Edinburgh, Hugh Martin, a free church minister, 
preached a famous series of sermons in Jonah, and he called his sermon here, The World Rebuking the Church. Sometimes the people in our community seem to show more compassion than the church. They can teach us how to behave. We can learn from people who are not Christians or not yet Christians. Jonah was sleeping soundly, oh, too soundly, but God was committed to waking him up. When they asked him who he was, the first thing he says about his identity is, I am a Hebrew. He's still proud of his Jewishness. He's proud of his nation. He's proud of being an Israelite. It's only afterwards he says he's a worshiper of God. Jonah had it a bit back to front there. If we find ourselves saying, I am an evangelical, I am a Presbyterian, I'm a Sunday school teacher, I'm a deacon, I'm an elder, I'm a pastor. We've got it wrong. We need to start in our identity with our relationship with God. And that should bring great fear into our lives. God is greatly to be feared. The disciples who were with Jesus in the boat in the Sea of Galilee they came to fear and understand that Jesus was God and that from that time on, his mission was to die for others. Shortly after Jesus identified himself as God in Matthew chapter 8, when he stilled the storm, just in chapter 12 of Matthew's gospel, he links his death and resurrection to the ministry of the prophet Jonah. And he says to the Pharisees, a wicked and adulterous generation, They want a sign. They ask for a sign. But none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. They tossed Jonah into the sea, and that was to become his grave for three days. They tossed Jesus into the ground, having killed him on the cross, and they thought he would never come back. But Jonah came back after three days. Jesus came back after three days. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. So I've got to finish. Here's the challenge of Jonah chapter 1. Do I want to spend 2021 with my eyes tightly shut? Do I want to spend 2021 lounging in bed asleep? Do I want to spend 2021 following the vision of my heart? Or will I ask God to share his heart vision with me and to show me this city as he sees it and then to show me my calling and my duty to love and reach people with the good news of Jesus even though there is a lockdown. Who will I listen to? God's word or my heart? The call of the gospel or my comfort? Can you see people around you that God values, who are lost, and who need to be found, and who need to be brought to a place of repentance, like the sailors, like the people of Nineveh, and yes, even like the prophet Jonah himself? Lord, we respond to your word today acknowledging that too often we do not see how great you are or how great your word is, and you may have to send some storms our way, and perhaps that's what COVID is, a storm you have sent our way to remind us that you and you alone matter and that your good news is to be shared with others. May we see people as you see them, and with hearts of compassion, may we love even our enemies. Show us grace and mercy, peace and truth, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our closing song today is Great is the Gospel of Our God.
God's blessing. May God's grace and mercy and peace be with you, with the people of our city, with the people of our region, with the people of our land, both now and forevermore. Amen. Praise the Lord who arms me for the fight He's my loving God and my castle strong My guard and my shield and the one who is my refuge O oh Lord, what is man that you care for him? The son of man that you think on him Man is like a breath and his days will fly like a shadow Part the skies and come down to us To the mountain smoke and remove your foes Reach down your hand And rescue me from the waters I will sing a new song to you, O oh Lord Ten string lyre, I will play your songs To the one who gives victory to kings And deliverance for David Deliver me from my enemies Whose mouths and hands are full of deceit That our sons and our daughters Will grow like flowers in their beauty Barns will be filled up with all we need and Our means of life we will see increase No breach of walls, no captivity And no crying in the street